I'll call this hearing uh, to order. The hearing is entitled Protecting the Electric Grid, the Grid Reliability and Infrastructure Defense Act. Today's hearing focuses on protecting the nation's electric grid from physical and cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities. A secure grid is of utmost importance to our national security, of course, and our national economic interest. Cybersecurity threats and vulnerabilities to the electric grid have increased in recent years and were the subject of several hearings in the 110th and 111th Congresses. There is evidence that bad actors have conducted cyber probes of U.S. grid systems and that cyber attacks have been conducted against critical electric infrastructure in other countries. This past February, a cyber attack dubbed Night Dragon, which is believed to have emanated from China, targeted the critical infrastructure of energy and petrochemical companies in the U.S. The Night Dragon attack was not overly sophisticated, but was nevertheless successful in breaching the computer systems of key assets. This example is one of several and it is really the tip of the iceberg and illustrates that we must be more vigilant in securing the nation's critical energy infrastructure, including the electric grid. Beyond potential cyber attacks, the bulk power system remains exposed to physical vulnerabilities and threats, including direct terrorist attacks, weapons that can create an electromagnetic pulse, and geomagnetic storms. Federal and state agencies and industry stakeholders have sought to address many of these concerns. In particular, through an extensive stakeholder process, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, pursuant to its authority under Section 212, uh, 215 of the Federal Power Act, has worked over the last several years to develop and implement reliability standards and to address grid security vulnerabilities in a timely manner. To address these shortcomings, the committee recently released a discussion draft entitled the Grid Reliability and Infrastructure Defense Act, or the GRID Act. The bill is identical to bipartisan legislation developed by this committee last Congress by Chairman Upton and uh, Mr. Markey. The GRID Act provides the Regu Federal Energy Regulatory Commission with emergency authority to respond to imminent physical and cyber threats to the bulk power system and electric infrastructure that serves facilities vital to our national defense. This emergency authority can be triggered only upon a directive from the President. The discussion draft also provides FERC with authority to identify and remedy weaknesses that leave the grid vulnerable to cyber attacks and electromagnetic pulse events. Notably, this legislation also directs FERC to develop regulations to facilitate the sharing of information as appropriate between government agencies, NERC, and owners and operators of the bulk power system. Doing so will improve communication among affected stakeholders, which will result, we hope, in a more secure grid. Although the discussion draft is identical to last year's bill, we expect that input from today's witnesses and insight provided by those witnesses will help us improve the bill to reflect current conditions and any changed circumstances. I know, for example, that uh, Congressman Franks has introduced legislation that is, I believe, more narrowly focused than this broader approach, and we look forward to his testimony to explain uh, his views on this area because he has spent a great deal of time on it, as has uh, Congressman Langevin. So I want to thank the witnesses in advance for being with us today. I will introduce them a little bit later, but at this time I would like to yield for the purpose of an opening statement uh, to Mr. Rush, the ranking member. I want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, you to all uh, the distinguished guests for being here today. Mr. Chairman, today we are holding a hearing on the Great Reliability and Infrastructure Defense Act or the GRID Act for short. This bipartisan piece of legislation 
is identical to the bill that was favorably reported out of the ENC committee unanimously last year and then went on to pass the House by voice vote before getting stalled in the Senate. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this bill represents the type of legislation that advances the security interests of all Americans and shows what can be accomplished when we choose to work together in a bipartisan manner. So I appreciate you conducting this hearing today, Mr. Chairman, and I hope and expect that we will move this bill with the same type of cooperation and collaboration that we experienced last season, last session rather, as this legislation moves through the committee. Mr. Chairman, the U.S. electric grid consists of interconnected transmission lines and local distribution systems that deliver electricity to our homes, schools, our offices, generation facilities, and related communications systems. The intricate design of the grid makes all of our components highly inter interdependent so that <clears throat> problems and outages in one location can lead to a domino effect of reliability concerns in other areas. In today's highly digital, digitized world, the operational controls over the transmission grid and generation, generators are increasingly managed by computer systems, such as the supervisory control and data acquisition or scatter systems, which are linked to the internet or other communication systems as well as to each other. This reliance on automation and two-way communication amplifies the grid's vulnerability to remote cyber attacks. Additionally, the increase uh, use of advanced metering systems and other smart grid capabilities leaves our electric grid even more open to, the, uh, to attack. Mr. Chairman, this bill will amend the Federal Power Act to add a new section, uh, Section 21, 2015A, which will give the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC, new authorities to protect the electric grid from cyber attacks as well as from, as well as from other threats, including those posed from geomagnetic storms created by solar activity. Additionally, this bill will provide FERC with the authority to issue emergency orders to protect against a grid security threat, whether by a malicious act, a geomagnetic storm, or by targeted physical attack if the president notifies the commission that such a threat exists. Mr. Chairman, we are all aware of the constant potential threats that our nation faces, rather by countries such as China and Russia, who have already conducted cyber probes and probes of the U.S. grid systems, or by terrorist organizations looking for ways to weaken our capabilities. Cyber attacks can cause untold harm to our nation's grid, and they can be done from faraway locations at very, very low cost and with little ability to trace the source of these threats. And so it is imperative that we provide those agencies that are responsible for protecting us, protecting our nation's grid, protecting all Americans with all the tools all the authority, and all the resources that they need to keep us safe. So, Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for holding this very important hearing today. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses and our experts on this critical issue. And with that, I yield back all the time that I have, which is one second. Thank you for being so generous once again, Mr. <laughs> Rush. This time I recognize the ranking member of the full committee, uh, Mr. Waxman, for the purpose of the statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Today, the subcommittee examines the grid reliability infrastructure 
Defense Act, this legislation is as bipartisan as they come. This legislation was born out of the bipartisan realization that our electric grid simply isn't adequately protected from a range of potential threats, and the current process for addressing vulnerabilities in the electric grid is not sufficient. In an emergency situ situation where the grid faces an imminent threat, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission currently lacks authority to require the necessary protective measures. There are also an ever-growing number of grid security vulnerabilities. These are weaknesses in the grid that could be exploited by criminals, terrorists, or other countries to dam damage our electric grid. These same weaknesses even make the grid vulnerable to naturally occurring geomagnetic storms. During the last Congress, Chairman Upton, Representative Ed Markey, Joe Barton, and I developed the GRID Act on a bipartisan basis. The majority of minority staffs had extensive discussions with interested stakeholders and agencies. We work with many members to answer their questions, address their concerns, and consider their constructive suggestions. This cooperative process produced strong bipartisan legislation. On April 15, 2010, the committee favorably reported the bill by a unanimous vote of 47 to 0. And on June 9, 2010, the GRID Act passed the House by voice vote on the suspension calendar. Unfortunately, the GRID Act did not become law in the last Congress. I commend the Chairman for taking up the GRID Act for consideration in this Congress. This bipartisan legislation will provide the FERC with the authorities it needs to address imminent threats to the electric grid with temporary emergency orders. It also directs the Commission to address longer-term grid vulnerabilities with standards written or approved by the Commission. In addition, the bill includes provisions that focus specifically on the proportions of the grid that serve facilities critical to the defense of the U.S., and the bill is budget neutral. These are important national security and grid reliability issues. In the last Congress, we heard from the Defense Department and from former Defense Secretaries national security advisors, and CIA directors. They all told us that the changes made by this bill are critical to our national security. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. Although we're likely to hear some in industry argue against providing FERC authority to address these serious threats, we worked across the aisle in the last Congress to develop workable legislation. I hope today marks the beginning of a similar process in this Congress. The GRID Act is simply too important to allow special interests to weaken its effectiveness. The committee needs to act to protect the nation's electric grid from cyber attacks, direct physical attacks, electromagnetic pulses, and solar storms. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Terry, would you like to make an opening statement? Okay. Okay, today we have three panels of witnesses, and on the first panel we have two members of Congress, the Honorable Trent Franks of Arizona and Mr. Jim Langevin of Rhode Island. We appreciate both of you being here very much, and uh, Mr. Franks, I'll recognize you for a five-minute opening statement. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to you, sir, and to Chairman, uh, uh, to Ranking Members Rush and Waxman and the rest of the fellow members here on the committee. I, I believe the subject of today's hearing is one of profound implication and importance to Western civilization. And consequently, I hope the members will feel inclined to read my written testimony. And I just thank you again for allowing me to testify here today. Mr. Chairman, in our technological advancement, we've now captured the electron and transported its utility into nearly every business, home, and industrial endeavor throughout the civilized world. In so doing, we've advanced our standard of living and productivity beyond dreams. But we've also grown profoundly dependent upon electricity and its many accoutrements. In keeping with one of humanity's most reliable hallmarks, we now find among our greatest strengths an unsettling vulnerability to EMP or electromagnetic pulse. The effects of geomagnetic storms and electromagnetic pulses on electric infrastructure are well documented, with nearly every space weather and EMP expert recognizing the dramatic disruptions and cataclysmic collapses these pulses can bring to electric grids. In 2008, the EMP Commission testified before the Armed Services Committee, of which I am a member, that the U.S. society and economy are so critically dependent upon the availability of electricity that a significant collapse of the grid, precipitated by a major natural or man-made EMP event, could result in catastrophic civilian casualties. 
This conclusion is echoed by separate reports recently compi compiled by the DOD, DHS, DOE, uh, and the National Academy of Sciences, along with various other government agencies and independent researchers. All of them, Mr. Chairman, came to very similar conclusions. The sobering reality is that this vulnerability, if left unaddressed, could have grave societal altering consequences. Now, like many of you, uh, I believe federal regulations should be very limited. However, our first national priority is national security. And to protect our national security, we must protect our major transformers from cascading destruction. To that end, I've introduced the SHIELD Act, which differs primarily from your discussion draft in three critical areas. Unlike the GRID Act, which I commend this committee deeply for passing last year, the SHIELD Act authorizes FERC to promulgate standards necessary to protect our electric in in infrastructure against both natural and man-made electromagnetic pulse events if the standards developed by the ERO are inadequate to protect national security. The SHIELD Act additionally requires automated hardware-based solutions rather than procedural and operational safety measures alone. And the SHIELD Act does not contain cybersecurity provisions, leaving the conflicting approaches to that extremely important issue uh, among the members of the Senate in particular uh, to be debated in a separate bill. Uh, automated hardware, Mr. Chairman, is particularly important when one considers the shortcomings of procedural and operational safety uh, measures alone in response to an EMP event. According to solar, solar weather experts, there is only 20 to 30 minutes warning from the time we predict a solar storm that may affect us to the time it actually does. This is simply not enough time to implement procedures that will adequately protect the grid. Furthermore, these predictions are only accurate one out of three times. This places a crushing dilemma on industry who must decide whether or not to heed the warning with the knowledge that a wrong decision either way could result in the loss of thousands or even millions of lives and massive legal ramifications beyond expression. Mr. Chairman and members, we are now 65 years into the nuclear age, and the ominous intersection of jihadist terrorism and nuclear proliferation has been inexorably and relentlessly hurtling toward America and the free world for decades. But when we add the dimension of asymmetric electromagnetic pulse pulses to the equation, we face a menace that may represent the gravest short-term threat to the peace and security of the human family in the world today. Certainly there are those who believe that the likelihood of terrorists or rogue states obtaining nuclear weapons and using them in an EMP attack is remote, and it may be a reasonable conclusion for the moment. But in the recent events of the Arab Spring, which our intelligence apparatus did not foresee, uh, it shows us that regimes can change very quickly. If terrorists or rogue states do acquire nuclear weapons, hardening our electric grid would immediately become a desperate national priority. Uh, however, that process will take several years, and while a regime cha change only takes a few weeks, a missile launch only takes a few minutes. Mm -hmm. The fact that we are now 100 percent vulnerable means that we should start securing our electric infrastructure now. Indeed, by reducing our vulnerability, we may reduce the likelihood that terrorists or rogue states would attempt such an attack in the first place. Now, thankfully, Mr. Chairman and members, uh, there is a moment in the life of nearly every problem when it is big enough to be seen by re responsible, reasonable people and still small enough to be solved. You and I live in that moment when there still may be time for the free world to address and mitigate the vulnerability that naturally occurring or weaponized EMP represents to the mechanisms of our civilization. Your actions today to protect America may gain you no fame or fanfare in the annals of history. However, it may happen that in your lifetime a natural or man-made event so big has an effect so small that none but a few will recognize the disaster that was averted. And for the sake of our children and future generations, I pray it happens exactly that way. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you, Mr. Franks. Uh, Mr. Langevin, you're recognized for a five-minute opening statement. I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Woodfield and Ranking Member Rush, and Ranking Member Waxman for allowing me to testify on what I believe to be one of the uh, most critical national security issues facing our country today, uh, securing our electric grid from cyber vulnerabilities, an issue to which I have devoted uh, several years um, uh, of my, my time and, and effort, and um, I'm honored to be here with uh, my colleague, Mr. Franks. Uh, as both a uh, 
a member of the House Armed Services Committee as well as the uh, House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, I sit at a very interesting nexus which gives me broad transparency into the national security challenges that face our nation today. Now, I previously testified on uh, this issue in 2009 after a bill that I drafted with then Homeland Security uh, Chairman Benny Thompson, which was adapted into then Chairman Markey's GRID Act, and I, of course, want to thank the committee for including me in this discussion again here today. Now, we know that there are a number of actors who seek to do harm uh, to our networks, from foreign nation states to domestic criminals and hackers to disgruntled employees. And as uh, threat and capability both grow, so does the risk to our critical infrastructure. Now, this threat uh, is not new. In the 110th Congress, as chairman of the Homeland Security Subcommittee with jurisdiction over cybersecurity, I conducted a detailed examination of cyber threats to our critical infrastructure. And I want to reiterate what I made clear in my previous testimony before uh, this subcommittee. I believe we remain vulnerable to a cyber attack against the electric grid that could cause uh, severe damage to our critical infrastructure, our economy, our security, and even American lives. Now, the vast majority of our critical assets are in private hands. And because fixing vulnerabilities can be costly, security can find itself in conflict with other priorities like profit, competition, and accountability to shareholders. Sadly, the American people are the ones placed at risk when the owners of our critical infrastructure fail to prepare for the worst-case scenarios. Now, I was pleased by the early attention paid to the issue of cybersecurity by the Obama administration. And despite uh, some delays in the process, I'd like to commend the administration for taking some very serious steps in the right direction. Under the leadership of Cyber Coordinator Howard Schmidt and his staff, the White House has released legislative guidance that envisions more government involvement in setting standards and best practices for cyber protection across all sectors of our critical infrastructure. This mirrors philosophically the framework of legislation I introduced earlier this year. Now, DHS has also taken important steps to become more involved in securing our critical infrastructure. The establishment of the uh, Industrial Control Systems Computer Emergency Response uh, Team, or ICS CERT, under Sean McGurk, uh, formalized a group of experts by fly and flyaway teams that could respond to cyber incidents across all sectors uh, of our utilities. <laughs> However, a company uh, must still uh, re request help from the government before it can be deployed. And the simple act of having to ask often forces decision makers in industry to steer clear of uh, seeking help for these complex problems. Now, I am pleased to see industry players increasingly stepping up to the plate to combat these threats, but I fear they cannot move fast enough or far enough under the current system. As Michael Asante, the president of the National Board of Information Security Examiners and former chief security officer at the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, testified last year, and I quote, we're not only susceptible, but uh, we're not very well prepared, end quote. Now, I supported the GRID Act uh, as, a, as a move through the House last year because it seeks to address some of the unique political and uh, regulatory challenges in our power industry today. Currently, we live in a, uh, under a system that does not prioritize security, though, but actively penalizes open reporting and cooperation. Now, the legislation that's before us today uh, aims to correct this by allowing federal regulators greater authority to protect Americans uh, during times of imminent crisis. It also provides for the issuance of orders to identify and mitigate vulnerabilities to protect the bulk power system from cyber attacks. While this measure is a significant step forward, I'd also encourage the committee to consider uh, provisions in, in my legislation and in uh, the Senate and administration proposals that expand this model to other sectors of critical infrastructure and enhance the ongoing efforts of DHS to quickly respond to a major crisis. I would also uh, note that my concern uh, that by specifying only the bulk power system, this legislation excludes critical distribution systems that would leave major cities like New York and Washington unprotected by the broader provisions uh, of this bill. I'll conclude by uh, cautioning again that inaction on this issue will make our nation increasingly vulnerable to cyber attacks from both outside and within. We know the threat exists and we have an opportunity to address it uh, before any further damage is caused. It is the responsibility of Congress and the administration to take the appropriate steps that will protect this nation. Once again, uh, I'd like to thank you, uh, uh, Chairman Whitfield and Ranking Member Rush, as well as uh, Ranking Member Waxman, for their attention to this very important issue and for the opportunity 
uh, to testify here today. I certainly look forward to working with the Energy and Commerce Committee and to supporting your efforts to raise awareness about securing our critical infrastructure and protecting our citizens from cyber attack. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Longevin. We appreciate the testimony of both of you. As you know, this is an important issue with um, great consequences for the country. And last year, of course, the GRID Act did pass the House of Representatives but was unable to get through the Senate. And w we are quite familiar with that. We pass a lot of things here that don't get through the Senate. But our objective is to get something through the House and the Senate and signed by the President. And uh, I know, uh, Mr. Franks, that a large number of members of the Armed Services Committee, and you serve on that as well, Mr. Langevin, uh, are, are co-sponsoring your bill. And, and I'm assuming, Mr. Langevin, that your bill and Senator Rockefeller's bill basically reflects the administration's proposal, is that correct or not? No. Well, I wouldn't so, go so far as to, to say that, but they both move in a, uh, in a similar direction. Okay. Well, I would like for maybe both of you to just give advice to this committee on what you think we need to do to maximize our opportunity to get this passed in the Senate. Mr. Franks. Well, Mr. Chairman, as it happened last year, I uh, went over and personally lobbied the Senate as hard as I could on the, on the GRID Act, even though, as I've laid out today, I believe that there are some critically important things that need to be added to it or changed. Uh, I met with uh, Ms. Murkow Senator Mikowski and others there in the, in the uh, chamber, and the big challenge was that they had differing strategies on what should be done about cybersecurity. Now, let me make it so desperately clear here. I believe that, uh, that cybersecurity is a critically important issue, and I, I think I would find myself largely in Mr. Langevin's camp on that issue. Uh, but the, the, the problem is that the personalities there had a little different strategies on how to address it, and I'm, I'm trying to, to maintain protocol here, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. They, they couldn't get together on that, and that's why that we felt like the issue should be separated, not because uh, that one is more important than the other, per se, but because uh, I just think it's going to be especially difficult. That's complicated this year, as you know. The White House just a few weeks ago, probably what you were talking about with Mr. Langevin, released a, a legislative proposal for nationwide cross-sector cybersecurity efforts, and the Senate is working to produce a goal to meet those needs. And my concern is that, that uh, if we tie them together, we may weaken both of them because there's very little disagreement on the EMP aspects of it. The senators were... Uh, very supportive of, of being able to, to, to protect the grid itself, just had some very seriously differing approaches to the cybersecurity element of it. Okay. Mr. Langevin, do you have a comment? Well, Mr. Chairman, I would just say that um, last year we were a bit frustrated by the, uh, the Senate uh, still uh, contemplating which path forward they were going to take. Um, uh, I was fortunate to to get a an amendment uh, included in the House Armed Services Defense Authorization Bill last year that would have uh, established a a, uh, a White House office on cybersecurity with a director's position that would have been Senate confirmed uh, and um, it would have uh, included updates to, uh, to to the FISMA law um, that did not get uh, through the conference committee last year because the Senate was still struggling to determine which direction they were going to take, whether it was going to be Rockefeller, Snow, or Collins, Lieberman. Um, I believe that the Senate has, uh, is moving in the, in the direction uh, of resolving those issues, and I'm hopeful that now that the White House has come out with its uh, guidance on, on their views on uh, cybersecurity going forward, that that will clear some of the hurdles in the Senate, and they'll be able to come to, together and uh, reach broader agreement, which hopefully will uh, allow the, the GRID Act, uh, uh, which is obviously a, an aspect, important aspect of securing our, uh, our bulk power system, uh, will allow uh, these issues to, uh, to clear the hurdles that, uh, that remain ahead. So uh, I would say it's perseverance. Uh, we're going to have to continue to keep the pressure on the, on the Senate, uh, but hopefully, uh, and I would say that I'm in close contact with uh, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse, uh, who's also from Rhode Island and who's also uh, one of the leaders in the Senate on cybersecurity, uh, he believes that uh, we will see bipartisan progress on the issue of cybersecurity in the Senate. So I'm, I'm hopeful that 
uh, we'll see a lot of these issues uh, addressed and we'll be able to get them through conference. Well, th thank you all very much, and uh, we do look forward to continuing to work with you because both of you have been leaders in this area, and we hope that we can continue to call on you for your uh, input. And at this time, I recognize the gentleman from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm going to be brief. Mr. Langevin, um, you, you have uh, expressed some uh, a level of uh, restraint regarding this bill and that you think that it could be strengthened, strengthened in certain areas. And uh, uh, I'm curious to say, I know that we want to send the, the best bill that we can to the Senate, you know, and then we'll be, then we can, uh, again, we can per persevere as you, as you have indicated. Uh, but uh, how do you think that we can strengthen this bill here? Well, a, a couple of things, uh, uh, Congressman Rush, I'd like to, uh, to see the approach that we're taking here addressing the challenges to the, uh, the bulk power system uh, broadened to include other areas of critical infrastructure. And because uh, some of them would be in this, the jurisdiction of the, the Full Energy and Commerce Committee, others may be in the, in the area of the Financial Services Committee. But I think that the approach that you're taking here is, is a positive one with respect to uh, to the, um, the, the, the power, the, to the electric grid. Uh, in addition to that, I would like to see uh, this bill address uh, distribution systems, not just transmission, but distribution systems. As I said, it's my understanding that uh, because distribution is not uh, dealt with in the bill, that areas like Washington, D.C. and New York uh, would be left out uh, of the, the intent uh, and hopefully the coverage that this legislation would provide, the protection that it would provide to our, our electric grid. So I'd encourage the committee to, uh, to look further at that issue. Well, Congressman Franks, do you have any, any, any suggestions along the same lines? Well, I think that uh, Congressman Langevin has it uh, absolutely right that, yeah. uh, that it, you know, I, I know we have pictures of New York and Washington, but we still want to keep them around for a while. Yeah. And uh, I think that it's wise to, to uh, extend that to the transmission lines. Um, again, my primary purpose here is to try to focus as narrowly as I can on uh, maintaining the base electric grid, because if that goes down, you know, our cybersecurity issues are no longer an issue because we don't have computer systems. We don't have uh, le the electricity to run them. Mm -hmm. And um, it might behoove the committee to consider a, a possibility of sending the Grid uh, Act over as it is and in a separate uh, version just addressing the EMP issue in case there is the, the uh, issue where the Senate can't come together on exactly how they want to do the cybersecurity. But I um, emphasize one last time that the cybersecurity issue is absolutely critical. I visited the, the uh, Palo Verde nuclear power plant in Arizona. It's just outside my district. It's the largest one in the nation. And uh, we had a hacker that was two strokes away from being able to, to go in and, and begin to monkey with the the, uh, the reactor itself. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, my state, uh, my, my General Assembly, my state legislature, they uh, just uh, on yesterday passed a, a bill out and sent it to the governor uh, addressing some of these same uh, matters. And uh, I'm interested in New York and I'm interested in the other cities that, that you named, but I'm also interested in the third city, the city by the lake, uh, Chicago, and what uh, the threats are that's pending to Chicago also. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Well, thank you, Mr. Rush. Uh, generally speaking, when we have members of the House or the Senate testifying, Chairman and Ranking Member, the only ones that ask questions. However, I would ask our friends on this side of the aisle if they have any questions. Mr. I Perry. don't, but... Uh I've worked with Trent uh, on his bill, and I just wanted to thank both of you for your good work. This is an extremely important issue, and uh, as the ranking and chairman both said, we, we need to get this to the point where uh, the Senate can pass it and we get it to the president's desk. So thank you for your efforts. Thank you. Yield back. Well, th thank you, Mr. Terry, and uh, once again, thank you all so much for your uh, concern and your leadership on this issue, and we will continue to work with you as we move forward. And uh, 
unless you all want to stay and hear the other panel, we'll let you go on in your other activities. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This time I'd like to call up uh, our second panel, which includes the Honorable Patricia Hoffman, who is the Assistant Secretary, Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability at the Department of Energy. We have the Honorable Paul Stockton, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Homeland Defense and America's Security Affairs at the U.S. Department of Defense. And we have Mr. Joseph McClellan, who is the Director of Office of Electric, Electric Reliability at FERC. So uh, welcome to the hearing, and thank you all for taking time to be with us and to uh, give us your uh, expertise and thoughts on, on this issue. So at this time, uh, Ms. Hoffman, I will recognize you for a five-minute opening statement. And I would just point out that there's a little devices on top of the table that has a red, green, and yellow light. And when it turns red, uh, we'd like for you to maybe think about coming to an end. Uh, and, but we won't hold strictly to that. But Ms. Hoffman, you're recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I would like to extend my thanks to the chairman and the esteemed members of the committee for inviting me here today to discuss cybersecurity issues facing the electric industry, as well as potential legislation intended to strengthen protection of the bulk power system and the electric infrastructure. Ensuring a resilient electric grid is particularly important since it is arguably the most complex and critical infrastructure that others depend upon to deliver essential services. The Department of Energy's Office of Electricity Delivery and Energy Reliability supports the administration's strategic comprehensive approach to cybersecurity. And specific with respect to the electric grid, we recognize that our focus should be on seven key areas. One is facilitating public-private partnerships to accelerate grid cybersecurity efforts. Two, funding research and development of advanced technology to create secure and resilient electricity infrastructure. Three, developing cybersecurity standards that provide a baseline to protect against known vulnerabilities. Four, timely sharing of information. Five, the development of risk management frameworks. Six, facilitation of incident management and response capabilities. And seven, the development of a highly skilled and adaptive workforce. Cybersecurity for the electric grid must not only address threats and vulnerabilities of traditional information systems, but also address the unique, unique issues to the electric control systems, such as SCADA systems and other control devices. The Cyberspace Policy Review underscores the need to strengthen public-private partnerships in order to design a more secure technology and improve, improve resilience of the critical government and industry systems and networks. As directed by HSPD-7, a public-private partnership must be established to effectively address national security concerns for critical infrastructure. However, private industry alone cannot be responsible for preventing, deterring, mitigating the effects of deliberate efforts to destroy or exploit critical infrastructure systems. Our office has long recognized that neither the government nor the private sector nor individual citizens can meet cybersecurity challenges alone. We must work together. OE supports and funds activities to enhance cybersecurity in the energy sector. Nearly all of the cybersecurity activities involve public and private partnerships. Through partnerships and competitive solicitations with the DOE, Department of Energy, National Laboratories, Indi Industry, and Academia, OE has sponsored research and development of several advanced cybersecurity technologies that are commercially available. And a couple of these examples include a secure serial communications for control system that has been commercialized by Schweitzer Engineering Laboratories, a software toolkit that provides auditing of SCADA security set settings, this was commercialized by Digital Bond, which is a small business. Vulnerability assessments of 38 different SCADA systems 
and a common vulnerabilities report to help utilities and vendors mitigate vulnerabilities found in many SCADA systems. Supporting the development of cybersecurity standards, our office is collaborating with NIST and other agencies and organizations to develop a framework and roadmap for interoperability standards that include cybersecurity as a critical element. The NIST Smart Grid Interoperability Panel Cybersecurity Working Group released the cybersecurity guidelines for the smart grid. OE also partnered with leading utilities in EPRI to develop cybersecurity profiles to provide vendor-neutral, actionable guidance to utilities, vendors, and government entities on building cybersecurity into the smart grid components at the development stage, including safeguards and implementing safeguards when integrated into the grid. OE supports continued investment in developing and building a cybersecurity workforce within the energy sector. Some examples include working with state and local governments and agencies to put together technical briefs, education forms, workshops, and exercises, just to name the few. The department fully supports the administration's proposed comprehensive cybersecurity legislation focused on cybersecurity for the American people, our nation's critical infrastructure, and the federal government's own networks and computer. Specifically, the administration proposes the following legislative changes to enhance protection of critical infrastructure. Voluntary government assistance to industry. Voluntary sharing with industry and states. And critical infrastructure security risk mitigation. In conclusion, I'd like to thank the committee for its leadership in supporting the protection of the bulk power system and critical infrastructure against cyber threats. DOE looks forward to working with Congress to further the dialogue, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. And Mr. Stockton, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, and all the distinguished members of the committee. I have a detailed statement, which I'll submit for the record, but I want to focus on a few key points that I make that I hope will be helpful to you as you exercise the leadership that we need coming from the House of Representatives and the Congress as a whole. First of all, the Department of Defense is not in the lead for energy security in the United States. For the federal government, that's my colleagues at the Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense is in support of them. But let me emphasize, the Department of Defense cannot execute its core missions in service of this nation unless we have a secure flow of commercial electric power. And that's for a simple reason. The Department of Defense depends for its energy 99% on the commercial sector. We don't own the commercial sector. We never will. We have no regulatory authority over it. But we are utterly dependent on the flow of that commercial power. Let me talk a little bit about why that's the case. In the modern way of warfare since 9-11, our forces deployed abroad, fighting in Afghanistan, Iraq, operating elsewhere, depend to an increasing extent on military facilities back here in the United States to conduct and support those operations, to generate, deploy, and operate forces abroad. We depend on military facilities in the states represented here today. And if there is an interruption in the flow of commercial power to those facilities for a short period they have backup power generation but for a longer disruption of the grid we'd be facing a situation of potentially devastating effects on our conduct of defense operations abroad and we could face serious challenges at home I'll talk about those consequences in a moment but first I want to talk a little bit about the nature of the threat. First of all, the cyber threat is something we take very, very seriously. That's why I'm so strongly in support of the administration's cyber security legislative proposal. But I want to emphasize that cyber is only one of the threat vectors that the nation faces. Simple kinetic attacks intelligently conducted by the adversary could have significant disruptive effects on the flow of commercial power to Department of Defense facilities in the United States. We heard uh, Congressman Frank speak eloquently about 
the risk of solar flares. Again, something we take very, very seriously. But Mr. Chairman, looking at you and the ranking member of the states that you're from, as well as other states represented here, I'd like to turn for a moment to the new Madrid fault and the threat that earthquakes pose as a sort of a representative way of looking at the nature of natural hazards. In the national level exercise we just conducted two weeks ago that posited for its scenario a 7.7 .7 earthquake on the new Madrid fault, our friends at uh, NERC estimated that there would be a multi-state long-term power outage, long-term, weeks, potentially months, rolling blackouts in Chicago and in the East Coast. And what I'd like you to think about is the downstream effects of such an event, both on critical Department of Defense operations in Fort Campbell, for example, every place else, all the facilities are represented here today, but also in the immediate area. Two things to think about. First of all, the way that the loss of electric power would magnitude the scale of the catastrophe to which we would all be responding. Municipal water systems in Memphis and elsewhere, they depend on the flow of commercial power. When that power stops, drinking water gradually gets turned off. And in a situation like uh, a New Madrid fault, gas lines are going to be broken. Fires are going to be breaking out. Where is the water pressure to fight those fires? Where is the gas to fuel the trucks that will be going to fight the fires or collect water elsewhere? Because, of course, as you all know, gas pumps and diesel pumps, they run on electric power. We'd very quickly be in a situation where we need to get emergency diesel power flowing to nuclear power plants, state emergency operations centers, everything else required to deal with the disaster. And this would be in a situation where roads and bridges are down, and there is so much demand for backup diesel power compared to the amount of diesel fuel that's prepositioned at these facilities. These are the examples of the kinds of ways in which the disaster would be magnified. But I'm looking at it from additional perspective. The Department of Defense would be supporting the governors of your states through FEMA, of course, and there'd be big demand to pull on the Department of Defense to provide additional support, at the same time that our response operations would be severely disrupted. With the loss of electric power, how are we going to receive the massive forces that would be coming in at the request of governors? How are we going to stage them, move them forwards? These are challenges that we need to take on very, very seriously. Now, the Department of Defense is doing so, and what I wanted to do uh, briefly is talk about some of the remediation uh, efforts we're taking. First of all, we're working closely with the Department of Energy to partner together in the federal government so we can reach out to industry and find out how we can work together with industry to provide industry with what we'd call a better design basis to ensure the resilience of the electric power grid against all of these hazards. I believe Today's power grid has very strong resilience, but it's not designed for the kinds of threats that we're talking about today, above all cyber or carefully designed kinetic attacks. We need to work together with industry to find a way to uh, enable them to build more resilience into the grid, and then inside the Department of Defense family, we need to do a better job of securing the flow of electric power to our critical defense facilities in all of the states represented here today to make sure that single points of failure on the flow of electric power coming in, we take care of those problems and we, we remedy those in partnership with the utilities in the same neighborhoods as our military facilities. Mr. Chairman, look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Stockton. Uh, Mr. McClellan, you're recognized for a five-minute opening statement. Thank you. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, Thank you for the privilege to appear before you today to discuss the security of the power grid. My name is Joe McClelland, and I am the Director of the Office of Electric Reliability at the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I am here today as a Commission staff witness, and my remarks do not necessarily represent the views of the Commission or any individual Commissioner. In the Energy Policy Act of 2005, Congress entrusted the Commission with a major new responsibility 
to oversee mandatory, enforceable, reliability, and cybersecurity standards for the nation's bulk power system. This authority is in Section 215 of the Federal Power Act. It is important to note that FERC's authority under Section 215 is limited to the, quote, bulk power system, end quote, which excludes Alaska and Hawaii, transmission facilities in certain large cities, such as New York, as well as local distribution systems. Under Section 215, FERC cannot author or modify reliability or cybersecurity standards, but must depend upon an electric reliability organization, or ERO, to perform this task. The Commission selected the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, or NERC, as the ERO. The ERO develops and proposes cybersecurity standards or modifications for the Commission's review, which it can then either approve or remand. If the Commission approves the proposed cybersecurity standard, it becomes mandatory in the United States, applying to the users, owners, and operators of the bulk power system. If the Commission remands a proposed standard, it is sent back to the ERO for further consideration. Pursuant to its responsibility to oversee the reliability and cybersecurity of the power grid, in January of 2008, FERC approved eight cybersecurity standards known as the Critical Infrastructure Protection, or SIP standards, but also directed NERC to make significant modifications to them. Compliance with these eight SIP standards first became mandatory on July 1, 2010. Although NERC has filed and the Commission has approved some modification to the SIP standards, the majority of the Commission's directed modifications to the SIP standards have not yet been addressed by NERC. It is not clear how long it will take for the SIP standards to be modified to eliminate some of the significant gaps in protection within them. On a related note, as smart grid technology is added to the bulk power system, greater cybersecurity protections will be required, given that this technology provides more access points, thereby increasing the grid's vulnerabilities. The cybersecurity standards will apply to some, but not most, smart grid applications. Moreover, there are non-cyber threats that also pose national security concerns. Naturally occurring events or physical attacks against the power grid can cause equal or greater destruction than cyber attacks, and the federal government should have no less ability to protect against them. One example is electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. An EMP event could seriously degrade or shut down a large part of the power grid. In addition to man-made attacks, EMP events are also naturally generated, caused by solar flares disrupting the Earth's magnetic field. Such events are inevitable can be powerful, and can also cause significant and prolonged disruptions to the grid. In fact, FERC, DHS, and DOE recent com recently completed a joint EMP study through the Na Oak Ridge National Laboratory. The study evaluated both man-made and naturally occurring EMP events to determine their effects on the power system and to identify protective mitigation measures that could be installed. Included among its findings was that without effective mitigation, if the solar storm of 1921, which has been termed a one in 100 year event, were to occur today, well over 300 extra high voltage transformers could be damaged or destroyed, thereby interrupting power to 130 million people for a period of years. Although Section 215 of the Federal Power Act can provide an adequate statutory foundation for the development of routine reliability standards for the bulk power system, a threat of cyber attacks or other intentional malicious acts against the electric grid is different. These are threats that can endanger national security that may be posed by criminal organizations, terrorist groups, foreign nations, or others intent on attacking the United States through its electric grid. Excuse me. Widespread disruption of electric service can quickly undermine our government, our military, our economy, as well, endang as, well as endanger the health and safety of millions of our citizens. Given the national security dimension to this threat, there may be a need to act quickly, to act in a manner where action is mandatory rather than voluntary, and to protect certain information from public disclosure. Faced with a cyber or other national security threat to reliability, there may be a need to act decisively in hours or days rather than weeks, months, or years. The Commission's legal authority is inadequate for such action. New legislation should address several key concerns. First, FERC should be permitted to take action before a cyber or physical national security incident has occurred. Second, FERC should be allowed to maintain appropriate confidentiality of security-sensitive information. 
Third, the limitations of the term, quote, bulk power system, end quote, should be understood as our current jurisdiction under 215 does not apply to Alaska and Hawaii, as well as some transmission facilities and all local distribution facilities. Fourth, entities should be able to recover costs that they occur to mitigate vulnerabilities and threats. And finally, any legislation on national security threats to reliability should cover not only cybersecurity threats, but also natural events and intentional physical malicious acts, including threats from an EMP. The GRID Act draft addresses many of these issues. Thank you for your attention today, and I look forward to any questions that you may have. Well, thank you all for your testimony. Uh, many of you heard uh, uh, Congressman Franks uh, uh, and, and, and Mr. Langjevin also talk about the need to uh, expand. Um, I, know, I noticed the White House in their cybersecurity proposal is exactly that, is focused only on cybersecurity. And uh, that was a suggestion that made Mr. Franks made that let's do cybersecurity in one bill, let's, let's address the other issues in a separate bill. Do you all have any thoughts as far as strategy, if that's something that the committee should attempt to do or, or not? Ms. Hoffman? As was mentioned um, earlier, is that cybersecurity is a difficult and complex issue, and EMP and other issues are, are different in nature, although the impact to the country can be devastating, either one. So in order to tackle things one at a time, the administration is looking just comprehensively at the cyber legislation individually. Okay. Mr. Stockton, you have a comment? Uh, yes, sir. I think that the uh, cyber legislation proposed by the administration is a critical step towards the protection of, of infrastructure as a whole, greatly benefit the energy sector as well. Uh, clearly, there are threats that we've been discussing that wouldn't be encompassed by this legislation, but it's a critical building block on which we need to make progress. Right. Mr. McClellan? Uh, I don't see where the, um, the uh, administration's bill would conflict with the GRID Act. The administration's bill provides a broad umbrella to partner with industry to bring the, uh, the uh, uh, practices uh, to a higher level. Mm -hmm. uh, the commission's authority under 215 doesn't uh, have to conflict and, uh, with that, uh, with that uh, concept. And in fact, any, any further enhancement of the commission's authority or any regulatory authority may actually complement mm -hmm. that concept. Well, you know, Mr. Langevin pointed out that the need to expand from bulk systems to expand your Section 215 authority. Do all of you agree that that should be done? I'm assuming you do, Mr. McClellan. Or... Um, as I pointed out in my testimony, uh, the Commission, uh, um, you know, our position or my position is that the distribution systems aren't covered. And so uh, we wish to point out that if the term bulk power system is, is followed, uh, there would be significant pieces of the power grid that would not be protected either from if the GRID Act passes, either right. from a cybersecurity or physical perspective. Right. Mr. Stockton, do you or Ms. Hoffman have any comments on that part? I think it's important to take a holistic look at, at cybersecurity. Um, as you look at the administration's proposal, it wants to take a comprehensive approach. So that would include entities that would be defined as critical, whether they're in the bulk power system or at the distribution. The, the important thing to note is we need everybody to understand how to advance cybersecurity procedures and postures, and I would say that includes state, state governments as well as any federal action. Mm -hmm. How would you all de describe the coordination between DOE, DOD, and FERC today on, on these types of issues? The coordination between DOD and DOE primarily looks at defense facilities and the interface with the energy sector. We do provide some support work on studies and looking at the interdependency between the energy sector and the defense. We're looking at microgrids. We're looking at advanced technologies in support of the defense facilities. Our coordination with FERC provides tools and technologies to look at improved reliability for the electric sector. We do coordinate it with information sharing to the extent possible looking at t technologies that will actually improve the posture of the system. So the coordination with FERC is they're a regulatory entity. The Department of Energy funds public-private partnerships. 
So in a sense, we are incentivizing changes within industry, and FERC looks at regulating uh, aspects of industry. Right. Anybody else have a comment? I'd say there are formalized mechanisms, as Ms. Hoffman uh, pointed out. There are formalized uh, mechanisms, such as the Government Coordinating Council, where the Department of Energy sits as the energy sector lead. FERC participates in those formalized initiatives with the other agencies. In addition, we have excellent working relationships on an or informal or an impromptu basis with the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, Department of Homeland Security, CIA, NSA and NRC. So we reach out as, as necessary to either borrow expertise or provide expertise uh, pursuant to power grid and, and uh, individual needs on the grid. When we talk about cybersecurity attacks, uh, in the U.S. I am not aware of any major uh, attack. And, 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 and internationally, what comes to my mind is the Stuxnet in Iran, which basically shut down some of their nuclear power systems. Are, are you aware of any other major cybersecurity attacks that have had significant impact? I'm not aware of any major significant attacks. Stuxnet was a very complex uh, attack on the on the within the nuclear sector. The issue is, or the focus though that we have is there are incidents that may occur and we need to be prepared to be able to respond to those incidents quickly and promptly. And so as we move forward, it's looking at how do we have an incident management plan or an incident response plan to be able to address the, the event quickly. So looking at information exchange, diagnostics, and the, the ability to deter and prevent any further damage. Okay, Mr. Rush, you recognize five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank uh, the witnesses. And in the last Congress, when we worked uh, on this issue in a bipartisan manner, the administration provided the members of this committee with a classified briefing that help us understand the vulnerabilities to our electric grid and the actions needed to protect that same grid. And I just have to ask uh, each, and every, each of you, in light of the fact that we have some new members, a lot of new members on this subcommittee, will, will each of you agree to, uh, at a time determined by the chairman, uh, to return and brief of the uh, members of this committee uh, again on the vulnerabilities of, uh, of our uh, cyber security area? Will each of you do that? Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, okay. Delighted. Well, um, let me just ask uh, Ms. Uh, Hoffman. You seem to feel as though, from the impression that I get, is that you seem to feel as though this is, okay, this is a step in the right direction, but it's narrow. And what the administration is looking at is a much broader uh, view. They're taking a more universal or broader view of, of this particular issue. If you were to overlay the administration's uh, efforts, its bill, its proposal, and the uh, Grid Act, what will you see, what will we see, and what will you see as being some of the most significant differences? Some of the, the administration's led, uh, proposed discussion draft focus on, focuses on several things. It looks at criminal um, aspects with respect to criminal charges and enforcement. It looks at voluntary information sharing. It looks at voluntary assistance. So it's building a public-private partnership to actually build capabilities and support to the industry sector, which is critically needed at this point in time. It also looks at the ability to develop plans, risk-based risk plans. Now, most of the critical infrastructure definition and the development of risk-based plans 
will, of course, be done through a rulemaking process through DHS. <clears throat> but the administration has taken a holistic approach of trying to get all the sectors up to a cybersecurity baseline performance. Now, in difference to the GRID Act, the GRID Act is focusing on transformers, EMP. It's focusing on emergency and standard development, uh, which is a slightly different approach from what the administration's position is, but both bills could be worked for complementary efforts. Any of the other witnesses have any comments on this? Well, let me ask you this. It seems as though uh, I know in my state, as I indicated earlier, yesterday uh, the members of the General Assembly passed a uh, smart grid uh, uh, regulation. All right. And it seems as though some of the states are starting to move on their own. But the administration has a discussion draft or a bill, a pending bill, uh, and I'm not sure whether or not these states who are starting to take actions are basing any of their efforts on what the administration is ultimately looking at. So how much cooperation, how much sharing of information, how much enlightenment uh, is the administration providing to these states so they won't have to come back and redo whatever uh, legislation they might pass prior to the administration uh, getting its, uh, its uh, bill passed. And what is the status uh, of the administration's proposal right now? So it's two questions. Uh, Ms. Hoffman, you might want to. The status of the, is it's a discussion draft and the administration is looking forward to working with members of Congress to continue that discussion, to advance uh, the components of that discussion draft. With respect to smart grid, there are security profiles and standards that are currently under development to, to provide security within the devices as they are being built. So we are working cybersecurity standards with the development of device as we uh, deploy and implement smart grid technologies. One of the things that we're trying to do is provide improved system performance, which can aid in uh, provide benefit for restoration time, outage management, so more preventative versus looking at the consequences if, if an event occurs. Gentlemen, I, my time is out. Thank you, Mr. Rush. At this time, I recognize the gentleman from West Virginia, Mr. McKinley, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Huffman, if I could maybe direct you. Uh, I, I've just got some I wasn't here when this bill passed last year, but I'm just curious if you could walk me through it or maybe one, someone else on the panel perhaps. Um, the, way I, the way I'm reading this, uh, the GRID, GRID Act, is uh, we, we start with subsection A of definitions, and then we move into B, which is emergency response measures, and that, that refers very specifically to security threat. And under that sec subsection B, it has a subsection 6, which has cost recovery. So there is a vehicle, a mechanism to recover costs for threat. Then it, if we can skip C just for the moment, that has to do with vulnerability. And then you go to D, which is called critical defense facilities. Under critical defense facilities, there is a subsection on page um, 15 about cost recovery. I'm just curious back on the one I skipped over, B. I'm sorry, yes, yeah, it would be, and the, or C, that's the, that's the uh, section that refers to uh, uh, grid security vulnerabilities. Under vulnerabilities, there is no cost recovery in, by this particular piece of legislation. Was that intentional? Was the uh, uh, vulnerabilities would not be able to recover the cost? The utility companies and anyone else would not be able to recover their cost? Whoever, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I singled you out this, but uh, I don't care who it is that answers that question. I can take a shot at that. Um, I, I believe you're correct. I believe that threats, um, you know, are singled out for cost recovery. I believe that 
under the 100 most critical facilities for the DOD, the user is required to pay for the, any upgrades or any enhanced measures. I didn't see cost recovery for vulnerabilities either. Does that make any sense to you that we that it's it's that there is someone that could have the expense if you if you read down through all of the issues that you have for um, if nothing else the large transformer availability right. there would right. be no way to recover the cost of having that on board. Right. Well, we've consistently said at the commission that we think that you know there must be three aspects present if you if you'd like to have someone move on one of these issues. One is you've got to identify it as a priority. Second, you have to identify mitigation. And third, you have to provide cost so we, recovery. So are you in agreement then that we probably should have some cost recovery under vulnerabilities? Personally, I say yes. Okay, thank you. Is there any, the rest of you have any problem with our cost recovery under vulnerabilities? Uh, we don't have any problem on cost recovery. Just recognize cost recovery, no matter what the actions are, is going to be recovered somewhere from the ratepayers, from the entities that's being protected. So. Eventually. Assuming so, the others are very clear. It's, it, um, I'm not an attorney. I'm an engineer. It just, it just tells me there's, when you leave something out, it looks like we've left it out deliberately. Um, there was a, um, another line that I, that I caught under, um, I think it must have been page 8. Yes, page 8 on line 22. It talks about uh, there under cost recovery, only those that incur were substantial costs. Could we get that clarified somehow? Uh, uh, can you all help us uh, with some language that might be more appropriate uh, to define what substantial costs would be? Um, I'm sorry, were you looking for a comment there? I, 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 <clears throat> given the time, no. <laughs> I, I hope that we can get something back on that. The last is is a little bit of a concern, Ms. Huffman, to your answer. Um, um, uh, so much of our defense is actually overseas, and we're going to be very reliant on on uh, their their uh, the other countries' responses to threats and vulnerability. Um, uh, you said we would respond quickly. Is there is uh, what what what? And you said you didn't know of any necessary attack. It, or, do we have any evidence of probing? Uh, uh, inquiries, photography, suspicious work, is there something going on? Because if one thing is to have an attack, the other is to have someone in preparation for it. Can you share any? I, I just don't have any information on that. Uh, with respect to overseas, I, I look at that. My focus is on the domestic U.S. infrastructure. So what, do, what, do, what should we do then if overseas? If we know that's certainly a possibility uh, with the terrorism that's going on, is there do we just simply rely on them and react, or re rely on the other countries to, 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 to provide the same type of s responses to threats and vulnerability, and then we react after it's happened? Or what role do you see us playing in trying to promulgate something now? With respect to international grid structures, uh, you know, Europe has their own sort of response mechanisms for any sort of emergency that happens on their system. I have to admit that I don't have a great insight or detail on how we should respond for an overseas issue. Is there some way that you, I know I'm running over on time now, is there, so that we could maybe work something like that into here, uh, something you could provide to us later, that, that how we might be able to integrate both the European and the American grid together? Or at least in, in, in terms of cybersecurity. Thank you very much. Did you want to respond, Ms. Hoffman? No, yes, I'm willing to have further dialogue. Thank you. Okay, thanks. This time I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Thank you for having this very important hearing. And uh, thanks to Mr. Franks and um, everyone else who is here uh, for their interest in this issue. Uh, Chairman Upton uh, has continued his efforts on the Bipartisan Grid Act, which I introduced with him in the last Congress. That legislation passed the House on suspension one year ago today. Uh, and Mr. Upton and I worked together in a bipartisan fashion to pass the bill a year ago, and I think this is a perfect example of bipartisanship. Uh, because remarkably, 99% of the electric energy used to power our military facilities, including critical strategic command assets, comes from the commercially operated grid. And over the last several years, the grid's vulnerability to cyber threats has come into sharp focus. The Department of Homeland Security revealed the so-called Aurora vulnerability 
through which hackers could use communications networks to physically destroy electric generators, transformers, and other critical assets. Just over a week ago, Lockheed Martin suffered what it called a significant and tenacious cyber attack on its system. And in today's Wall Street Journal, a description of the Defense Department's cybersecurity plan has a military official quoted as saying that if a terrorist or other adversary shuts down our power grid, maybe we will put a missile down one of your smokestacks. Unlike the frequent outages experienced by Pepco's customers every time the Washington, D.C. area experiences a serious storm, a coordinated attack on the grid could literally shut down the U.S. economy, putting lives at risk and costing tens of billions of dollars. Damage from such an attack could take months or even years to recover from. Moreover, recovery from such an event may not just be a matter of rebuilding. Three nuclear reactors in Japan have suffered near complete core meltdowns after the earthquake caused a loss of electricity needed to cool them down. Unit 1's meltdown likely began just a few short hours after the earthquake, tsunami, and blackout. The hot radioactive fuel is believed to have burned holes that are as much as 10 centimeters wide through the presser, pressure vessels. It is expected to take months to stabilize the reactors and decades to clean up the damage that the melt meltdown caused. And Mr. Stockton uh, mentioned uh, that the power uh, outage risk associated with earthqu earthquakes near the New Madrid fault line is notable because there are extra nuclear reactors uh, located near it, and uh, those several reactors uh, could be vulnerable. So, Mr. McClellan, let me ask you this. Here in the U.S., in the past eight years, there have been at least 69 reports of emergency diesel generators failing at 48 nuclear reactors. 19 of these failures lasted for more than two weeks, and six lasted longer than a month. And there aren't any requirements that spent nuclear fuel pools have backup power at all when there is no fuel in the co reactor core. Clearly, a blackout could cause a meltdown in this country, too. Mr. McClellan, do you believe that the portions of the grid that supply electricity to our nuclear reactors, that is, electricity to the reactor, not from the reactor, are more secure than the rest of the grid? The um, Commission has been working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission on this issue, and there are three sources of power. There's the off-site power, which you've just asked about, the on-site diesel generator. So they are more secure? Are you yeah. saying they are more secure? The, uh, there are agreements in place between the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. No, but uh, today, are they more secure than the, than the rest of the system or not? Uh, today. In any cases, no. No, the answer is no. Thank you. Mr. McClellan, since the legislative hearing this committee held in October of 2009, have sufficient measures been put in place to secure the American electrical grid from cyber and physical attack? There has been some progress on the NERC standards, uh, some submission as far as... Have sufficient issued. measures been put in place? We are... Uh, we, sufficient is the key word. We have uh, issued inquiries to the, to the NERC. So are you saying that they have, there are sufficient? There, there has been some filings made, and we're checking the status of those filings to see whether or not they, they do indeed represent progress. Well, let me ask you this. Given that the number of cyber access points to the grid is increasing rapidly with the growth of smart grid applications, do you believe the threat facing the grid is greater or less than it was a year ago when the House overwhelmingly passed grid security legislation, given the fact that a smart grid actually winds up with more vulnerabilities, ironically, yes, uh, the, than the one threats that is are greater. Not. So you think it could there could be greater vulnerabilities? Undoubtedly, yes. And do you? I, I thank you. Uh, do you believe that the way the grid security standards are currently set is even capable of leading to the rapid adoption of standards that are sufficient? to responding to the threat that our grid faces. The Commission has said on numerous occasions that uh, when it comes to national security, the process, the standards development process is too slow, it's too open, and it's too unpredictable. Mr. To Stockton, do you agree with that? Uh, he's better positioned to uh, assess uh, the adequacy Ms. of Hoffman? the regulatory environment. Yes or no? There's room for improvements. Room for improvement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Terry, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you. And uh, for uh, 
Mr. McClelland, I appreciate. Uh, in the SHIELD Act uh, versus the GRID Act on FERC authority, uh, do you feel that you, you need additional level of authority to respond to a national security threat? Could you be more specific in that? Then on the flip side of that additional authority is how we balance that with uh, state regulatory entities. The, um, the SHIELD Act provides the Commission with a, uh, a, a proviso that if it finds the NERC standard uh, insufficient, it can author a measure to put into place to address a, a security vulnerability. Um, the Commission currently under the 215 process cannot author or modify uh, reliability standards. We can't author or modify uh, NERC alerts. We can provide input, but we cannot uh, author or modify. We feel, I feel it's important that the Commission be giving that direct authority to be able to order uh, interim measures or measures to be put into place to write those measures and to uh, direct that they be put into place to address vulnerabilities to the, to the ball power system or threats. And in regard to that, do you foresee any difficulties then working with state regulatory agencies on those same issues? I think it's going to be very important that the Commission coordinate not only with the state regulatory agencies but with the electric reliability organization and with the affected entities that the Commission uh, communicates with. So, yes, I think it's very important. Ms. Hoffman, do you have any thoughts in regard to the uh, additional jurisdictional requests? I think it's absolutely important for the federal FERC to coordinate with the state entities in looking at cybersecurity vulnerabilities, mitigation measures, solutions, because as we move forward, the more educated and consistent we are across the board as we take a comprehensive approach the more it will benefit not only the electric sector but other sectors that may have the involvement with states or other entities. All right. Thank you in that regard. The, uh, the other question I have uh, in regard to the hardening of the grid, what type of uh, hardware solutions exist out there? Uh, would you have under the SHIELD or GRID Act the appropriate uh, ability, authority to, for want of a better word, mandate uh, the technology and uh, is there any uh, conclusions on what the costs would be uh, nationally to adopt the hardware solutions? Mr. McClellan. There are, um, you know, there's several different aspects of electromagnetic pulse. Uh, if, if we uh, confine the discussion to the high altitude electromagnetic pulse from a nu nuclear detonation, that's a good example because it includes all three components. E1 is a high energy radio frequency burst. E3 is a uh, ground induced currents. The ground induced currents attack bulk power system transformers. They find their way onto the bulk power system transformers and destroy those transformers very quickly. Uh, one uh, tried and true method is series compensation, that is to say putting capacitors in the line that stops the flow of ground induced current, assuming there are no parallel paths to that, uh, that line. On back to E1, it's, it's more difficult, it's more challenging. Uh, I did receive some information from recently from an Israeli scientist that shows a promising technology uh, for erecting a Faraday cage. Faraday cage would block the E1 component and it's a simple uh, spray-on, a metallic spray-on coating that looks very promising in this area. So there is development that's been undertaken. There are others in the world that have deployed effective mitigations against electromagnetic pulse. Uh, we've not done so. In, in At what country. cost? Um, I, I can get back to you with those numbers. I do have those numbers, but just not at my fingertips. So, and e, and I'll, just, I'll just say this right up front. I think E1 is more challenging, but I do have numbers also for E1 that right. I can get back with Mr. you. Mr. Stockton or Ms. Uh, Hoffman? Ms. Hoffman first. I would just add to that. Uh, Joe adequately talked about some of the hardening type activities that could be done. The other things to keep in mind is the current state of health of the transformers. You can do some hardening, but if the, the current health of the transformer is not where it should be, there will be vulnerabilities. So also assessing the current health of the transformer will also impact to what level of uh, deterrence or capability they'll be have to withstand an EMP or a, a geomagnetic solar flare. 
some of the things that we need to ask is how much do we want to harden against? Are we talking about a 200 amp type thing or what is currently tested up to is an 80 amp? The other thing is, do we have enough manufacturing capability of transformers in the United States? As we look at it, hardening is only one solution, and there are several sets of solutions that we must keep in mind. Uh, let me follow. Bu building resilience into the system so we can provide for rapid return of functionality. That's another alternative to hardening. We need to be able to ensure that we can from a Department of Defense perspective, get back to conducting our core missions uh, no matter what. Sometimes hardening will be the best, uh, most cost-effective approach. Other times, quick restoration of enough power to do the bare minimum to operate those core functions. That makes better uh, sense from a cost-effective perspective. Ms. McMorris Rogers is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to all the witnesses for being here today. I appreciate your testimony, and we've certainly heard about the vulnerabilities, and it, uh, it suggests that there does need to be better coordination between uh, the private sector and uh, the government. Commissioner McClelland and uh, the rest of the panel, what are the standard operating procedures for an agency that has regulatory or other authority over a critical sector of our economy when a, a critical, a credible threat is received. For example, how does FERC communicate? Does it direct NERC to issue standards? How are those standards communicated to users of the system? And what is the protocol for NERC? If I, if I might start with the correction, it's Mr. <laughs> McClellan. Uh, I'm not yes. a commissioner. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I'll answer your question by saying it depends on the issue. Um, if, if, if it's an urgent matter that affects just a few entities, it may be very appropriate, and the Commission has done this, to bring in uh, um, members of the affected utility who have security clearances, brief them in detail on the perceived uh, vulnerability or threat, and work out a tabletop solution as to how they might increase their preparedness for some interim period of time. It wouldn't be appropriate, necessarily appropriate, to try to develop a standard around a very sophisticated targeted threat that exploits a vulnerability uh, with, with uh, a handful of entities. If it's a larger issue, the Commission engages in a rulemaking procedure. And so the Commission uh, would order uh, NERC, either upon filing or upon its own motion, to address a specific issue, a security issue. Uh, NERC would then uh, receive the order, engage industry through industry volunteers in a standards development process. That process routinely takes years. Um, at the end of that time period, NERC would submit a standard, and the Commission would be in the position to either approve the standard, at which time it would become mandatory and enforceable, or to remand the standard for further work, at which time uh, NERC would take it back, consider the Commission's comments, and continue uh, to uh, pick up that issue and, and work on the standard. If I may add to that, please. With, uh, with respect to a cyber event, generally we follow the national uh, cybersecurity response framework, but cyber events will generally be coordinated through U.S. CERT. They'll go through some analysis and forensics. They'll bring the electric sector coordinating, or the energy, excuse me, the energy sector coordinating council as well as the government coordinating council. They'll do risk and consequence analysis to determine how, how is that going to impact the sector share it with the industry, the information that's available, and then be able to actually move forward with the industry's help on mitigation measures. So it's really key to having that information sharing and that quick response capability that's very important. May I add just one Please. thing to that? If, if it's the, the only action that's mandatory is a standard, until such time as uh, the ERO or NERC develops a standard, submits to the Commission, and it's approved, um, nothing is mandatory. So there are some other interim actions. NERC can issue an alert, for instance. It could be an advisory, a recommendation, or an essential action. None of those would be mandatory, but they do show levels of increasing urgency. NERC can convey the information to the industry, ask for, say, a follow-up uh, you know, response, and, uh, and then communicate to the industry the importance of those levels. But outside of a standard, nothing is mandatory. Do you believe that the current system is effective? 
and how could it be enhanced? I think that the current system can be effective for routine reliability matters, just uh, tree trimming, for instance. But when it comes to national security issues, these are fast-moving, very sophisticated, sometimes highly targeted um, uh, situations, and uh, we've come to the conclusion that no, the standards development process is not adequate to address these types of issues. Although it can raise the bar to narrow the universe of attackers, it is not adequate in the case where national security is jeopardized to use the standards development process. Mm -hmm. Would you? Mm -hmm. if, if I may add, there's room for improvement. Mm -hmm. From the perspective, we need to do a better job with respect to information sharing, and I think that goes back to what is in the administration's comprehensive bill as well as this, is looking at protection of information. That information sharing is a key critical com component to getting to an effective response and mitigation measures, whether it's done by the industry by themselves or it's actually looked at from a different action point of view. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Olson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'd like to welcome the witnesses and thank you all for coming and giving us your expertise and your time. Um, I've got a couple questions for you, Mr. McClellan, and you, Ms. Hoffman. Uh, specifically, if the FERC or the DOE had to order a, gener a generating unit to operate for reliability, reliability purposes or in an emergency situation, and doing so, would result in that unit exceeding an environmental permit limit, would FERC or DOE indemnify the unit operator from any and all agency action or private citizen lawsuit liability? I will get back to you for further clarification, but it is my understanding we cannot, uh, we do not have jurisdiction over another agency's uh, fines, penalties, regulations. Mr. McClellan? Uh, the Commission has acted in conjunction with DOE on one other occasion in my memory. It was the first time that Section 207 of the Federal Power Act had been invoked. DOD invoked Section 202. Uh, in that particular case, there were uh, generating units uh, serving uh, the Washington, D.C. region and transmission upgrades that needed to be uh, performed. In that case, however, uh, both DOE and FERC uh, w did not need to uh, conflict or clash with the environmental regulations. So uh, I, I know of no case where that's already occurred, but uh, we can certainly, I can certainly uh, posit that back to our, our general counsel and we can answer that question for you. Thank you for that. I, I just want to know, you know, what could happen? What's the realm of possibility to a company that obeys the orders from you and, and your respective agencies, but in doing so, they exceed some environmental limitations from some other agency? I mean, this is a serious problem. I mean, if they ask, if you tell them to do this because there's reliability issues or emergency situations, then by gosh, they're going to do that. And that's the right thing to do. But certainly, we don't want to have any exposure to them for doing what one arm of the government tells them to do and the other arm says, no, you guys exceeded some permitting process. We're going to punish you for doing that. I mean, again, I'd, I'd greatly appreciate your answers to those questions because I've had some operators back home in Texas ask me these exact questions because we have many, many natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, um, you know, freezes, all the above that's impacted sometimes our reliability of our grid. And I know there's differences between, you know, some of our systems in Texas, but again, we do have some people out there who are very concerned about this, and I appreciate and answer those questions. That's all I have. Yield back my time, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olson. Uh, thank you all very much for taking time to come and testify. We appreciate your input and look forward. Yes. Mr. Chairman, if I may, uh, this is uh, something that's kind of gnawing at me because I, I've heard uh, and I've tried to get to this this issue uh, in my line of questioning. Is there an administration bill and has that bill been filed and is it here in the Senate? I mean, not here in the Senate. Is it in the Senate? I know it's not in the House. Uh, well, maybe um, they may be able to answer. It was my understanding, and I may be wrong, that Mr. Rockefeller had introduced a bill is, similar to the administration's request, but maybe they could answer it. Is that in the bill, Ms. Hoffman? I don't, have, I don't have explicit knowledge. All I have right now is the discussion draft, so I'm just not aware. Do you know Mr. Stockton? The, the same discussion you No, know Mr. McClellan? Sorry, it's the same. So the White House doesn't talk to you all anymore and it talks to us, right? 
We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Mr. Markey? Can I just be recognized for two additional minutes to ask? Um, so I just have a, a, just another question, too. Without objection, I'll give you two additional minutes. Okay, I thank the chairman very much. Um, this is a very serious threat to our country. We know that al-Qaeda and others are targeting us, and we know that there are many, many PhDs inside of al-Qaeda, whether we like it or not. You know, that's what we found in Boston when Muhammad Atta and those other nine, you know, were up there in my district plotting on hijacking those two planes in my district. I mean, this is, they were well-educated people, you know, very smart. They tried to find the aperture, um, and, uh, and they found it in the aviation system. But uh, they're very technically sophisticated people. You know, that's the one thing we did learn about al-Qaeda, and that's why I have such a passion for this issue. Uh, back in 2006, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation proposed some grid security standards that seem to be fairly limited. One of them even allows utilities to decide for themselves which of their assets are critical and thus subject to the standards in the first place. Only 29% of power generating owners self-reported that they owned a single critical asset. Isn't that right, Mr. McClellan? Yes. All right, so they didn't, none of them, most, 70% 70, 70 of the electric utility industry felt they had no critical a assets, okay? A critical. And, uh, and that, excuse me? I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say the distinction is uh, critical cyber assets. Those yeah. are the assets that fall into the standards. Yeah. And, uh, and I just think that that's a, you know, that, that's a mentality here that we have to be realistic about. You know, we've moved to a new era. Um, we are potentially under assault uh, in this uh, sector. Uh, uh, in the same way that you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the, the attack on the Iranian nuclear facility. Uh, that was just a very smart way of some very smart people figuring out how to disable a nuclear power plant in Iran from a distance and thank, thank goodness whoever those people are that they're able to do it, disable it, and still not cause a, a nuclear disruption. But uh, there may be others that are not so benign in, their, uh, in what their objectives are in the harm that they can uh, do. So I just think that uh, this isn't something where you self-identify yourself as potentially being a problem. I think we have to decide that there is a problem and that al-Qaeda is out there. And do you agree with that, Mr. McClellan? I, I would, yes, and I, I would just add one distinction that um, NERC has submitted a standard to the commission, SIP2, where uh, critical assets, now there are several designations for critical assets, uh, Assets that serve nuclear facilities, for instance, are now deemed critical assets. The commission, however, has requested additional information mm -hmm. because critical assets are not the assets that are covered by the standard. It's critical cyber assets. So the commission has asked one of the lines of questions is, tell us how that translates to critical cyber assets because those indeed are still self-determinations. Right. And is, is, is NERC's guidance advisory or mandatory? The, the standard that NERC has proposed to the Commission would be mandatory, and that would be the designation, bright line designations of critical assets, which can help guide an entity to self determine critical cyber assets, thank you, which Mr. fall into the standard. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Thank you all. Uh, thank you once again for testifying. We look forward to working with you, and at this time I'd like to call up the third panel of witnesses. That would be Mr. Jerry Cawley, President and CEO of North American Electric Liability Corporation. Uh, Mr. Franklin Kramer, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs at the U.S. Department of Defense. And Mr. Barry Lawson, Associate Director, Power Delivery and Reliability at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. Welcome to the uh, hearing. We look forward to your testimony. And uh, at this time, Mr. Cawley, I will recognize you for the five minutes for the purposes of your opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon, Chairman uh, Whitfield. Is your microphone on? Uh, thank you, and good afternoon, Chairman Whitfield and Ranking Member Rush and members of the subcommittee and fellow panelists. As CEO of the organization charged with ensuring reliability and security of the North American grid, I wake up every day concerned about emerging risks caused by the intentional actions of our adversaries who would want to harm our nation and our citizens. The security of the North American bulk power system is an utmost priority for NERC. 
The mainstay of NERC's critical infrastructure program is a set of nine cybersecurity standards that we actively monitor and enforce. We have recently made significant strides uh, as in improving our cyber standards. When I came on board at NERC in 2010, I recognized the importance of establishing bright line criteria, as we just heard from the previous testimony, uh, to identify critical assets to be protected. A new standard was developed in six months and filed with the Commission in February of this year and is pending their approval. Our standards, works, our standards process works for what it was intended to do, to establish sustained baseline requirements for the reliability and resilience of the bulk power system. However, there's no single approach, not even compliance with mandatory standards, that will protect the grid against all potential threats from physical and cyber attacks. The threat environment is constantly changing and our defenses must keep pace. Achieving a high degree of resilience requires continuously adaptive measures beyond those outlined in our standards, measures we are actively pursuing today. The most important of these activities is the operation of our electricity sector information sharing and analysis center. In this role, NERC works closely with federal partners to promptly disseminate threat indications to electricity sector participants. NERC staff has the necessary security clearances to work with the Department of Homeland Security, DOE, and federal intelligence agencies to generate unclassified recommendations and actions for industry. Using this process, NERC has issued 14 security-related alerts since January 2010, covering such items as Aurora, Stuxnet, Night Dragon, and others. The NERC alert system is working well, coupled with our SIP standards and the option of using a new expedited and confidential process for developing standards, NERC has a strong foundation of tools we need to protect the cybersecurity of the bulk power system. As outlined in my written testimony, NERC is leading a number of other initiatives to ensure the resilience of the bulk power system, including joint efforts with DOD, DHS, and Department of, Department of Energy. We're preparing an industry-wide grid exercise in November 2011. Jointly with DOE NAB labs, we are initiating a program to monitor grid cybersecurity of, of the, sky, of the uh, grid networks and another program to improve the training and qualification of industry cyber experts. With regard to the proposed draft legislation, first and foremost, NERC has consistently report, supported legislation to address cyber emergencies and to improve information sharing between government and the private sector. NERC has consistently supported comprehensive legislation authorizing a government entity to address cyber emergencies, which agency is a policy decision for Congress. NERC stands ready to assist in responding uh, to designated grid security threats. Measures to improve information sharing between the government and private sector of critical infrastructure are needed. NERC commends the provisions of the discussion draft directing the Commission to facilitate sharing of protected information. While the focus on providing adequate security clearances is key, to, uh, is key this alone is not enough. It is most important to develop methods for declassifying sensitive information to make it available to industry decision makers. New authority to address grid security vulnerabilities, however, is unnecessary. FERC already has the authority under the Federal Power, Power Act, Section 215, D5, to direct NERC to prepare a standard to address a specific vulnerability. If Congress decides to allow vulnerabilities to be addressed through a FERC rule or order, at a minimum, the ERO should be given the opportunity to address the identified vulnerability before FERC acts. With FERC given a backstop authority if the ERO fails to address the vulnerability within a prescribed period. While we appreciate the language in the current draft, which calls for FERC to request and consider our recommendations, if time allows, we believe more is, is needed. Other provisions of the discussion draft are not needed. Uh, NERC has issued information to ensure industry, uh, the industry understands and is mitigating the aurora vulnerability. The provisions on geomagnetic storms and spare transformers also are not needed, as FERC already has the authority to order us to address these topics today. NERC is actively working on the GMD issue including a recent workshop and, a, and an alert providing industry with operational and planning actions to prepare, to prepare for the effects of a severe geomagnetic uh, disturbance. In addition, a NERC, work a NERC task force is focused on mitigating risks associated with long lead time transformers and developing a secure database for sharing information on spare equipment. Finally, the ERO should be given authority under FERC oversight to address grid security vul vul vulnerabilities by enforceable means other than standards. Congress has provided us with many tools to address security. As noted previously, we have three levels of alerts. We have strong industry participation and response to these alerts. 
including a provision to authorize NERC, subject to FERC oversight, to promulgate legally enforceable directives would enhance the security of the power grid. I believe legislation addressing the security of our nation's electricity infrastructure could be beneficial, but the framework should focus on enabling information sharing between government and industry and problem, problem solving between the private and, and government sectors. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Colley. Mr. Kramer, you're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Mr. Ranking Member, Mr. Terry. Appreciate the opportunity to testify. I think the proposed legislation, uh, the GRID Act that you have up in the discussion draft is excellent, but I'd like to suggest five things that would actually make it better, at least from my perspective. Uh, the first is I think that we need mandatory federal standards. We need to turn the system around uh, and have the federal agency, be it FERC or uh, as in the administration's discussion draft, DHS, have the authority to issue standards. Secondly, I think that we need to focus much more on the issue of resilience. How will we deal with the problem of how the grid will operate uh, in the face of attack? Third, I think that the, all elements of the federal government, and including especially the DOD, have to be given clear authority to help protect and or respond to an attack on the grid because it's only the DOD that has the capabilities that are necessary. Fourth, I think we have to think about the issue of scale and resources, and particularly the issue of cost, uh, and make sure that the industry can recover its cost. And lastly, I think there needs to be a much more extensive research and development program to deal with the advanced threats. We need advanced capabilities. Now, the reason I say that, Mr. Chairman, all these points uh, is what you've already said. The threat's increasing. Uh, We've seen, for example, last year an attack on Google. We've seen more recently an attack on the company called RSA, very advanced cyber companies. And as you mentioned, we've seen the Stuxnet attack. Uh, those control systems that were attacked uh, in Stuxnet are precisely the kind of control systems that control the electric grid. The vulnerability is very, very substantial and has been pointed out by others already in this hearing. Uh, right now, with the smart grid increasingly coming into play, the distribution system as well as the generation system, the transmission system, are sources of vulnerability. So I think we really need to focus on the entirety of the problem and recognize how much the threat has been increasing over time. The reason I say that we need mandatory standards is that, frankly, the, the current system is just too slow. It doesn't work quickly. It hasn't satisfied the problem. In fact, if you look at NERC's own, I think it was called High Impact Low Frequency Study last year, it said very clearly uh, that the grid is at risk uh, against an advertent adversary. Um, if we think about other areas, uh, clean air, clean water, automobile safety standards, the federal government issues the standards. It certainly allows industry to comment, but I think that's the way we ought to do it. In addition, I think that the current act, the discussion draft, has what's called authority for the FERC if there was a so-called imminent threat. Um, but I think that imminent is too late often. Uh, what we really need is if we see a significant threat where one needs to be able to take prompt action uh, before we get to that microsecond before the attack occurs, the federal government ought to have that authority. Uh, so it can issue interim standards, but more earlier than the imminent threat standard. On the resilience point, uh, I think we all know, and again, if you look at the Google attack or Stuxnet or the like, is that cyber offense beats cyber defense. In fact, the Deputy Secretary of Defense has said that publicly plenty of others have. In the DOD area, the DOD doesn't just rely on passive defense. It also does what's called active defense. And if DOD needs to do active defense to protect its networks, critical infrastructure, and again, we heard and I've t uh, said myself, written myself, and others said today, the DOD relies 99.9% on commercial electricity. Well, that means that that commercial electricity ought to have the same kind of protection, that act of defense. I don't think that the industry should do it. I think the DOD, under the right kind of standards, right kind of legislative standards, regulation, guidance from the president, ought to work with the sector-specific agency and also with the industry to be able to provide that. We also need to have capabilities that we haven't heard talked about today. We need what I call gold standard integrity. Uh, integrity of data, integrity of software, integrity of hardware. We need capabilities like segmentation and isolation 
so that the key elements of the grid can be protected by being separated from other elements of the grid. Uh, we want to look also, finally, at the issue of scale and resources. Um, it's a very large enterprise. We're going to have to have the private sector work to get it out there. It seems to me that if the industry is going to incur costs, and this is a highly regulated industry, that it ought to be able to recover those costs. That could be done directly or indirectly with the federal government. It could be in the rate base, but it should be allowed in some way, shape, or form. And finally, as I said, I think we need to have a comprehensive R&D program so that when we have advanced threats, we can have advanced capabilities to meet them. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, Mr. Lawson, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairman Whitfield, Ranking Member Rush, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today on cybersecurity and the GRID Act. My name is Barry Lawson, and I'm the Associate Director of Power Delivery and Reliability at the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, which represents over 900 member-owned not-for-profit cooperatives providing electricity to 42 million consumers in 47 states. Over the last decade, I've been involved in a variety of critical infrastructure protection and cybersecurity initiatives with industry, NERC, DHS, and DOE. Based on these experiences, I know the electric power industry takes these issues very seriously. Additionally, to my knowledge, there has not been a documented case of a successful attempt to damage the North American bulk power system through cyber means. While my testimony today is offered on behalf of electric cooperatives, I want to also recognize a longstanding partnership among all sectors of the electric power industry when it comes to reliability and cybersecurity. NRECA is part of a coalition which includes major trade associations representing the full scope of the electric power industry as well as state regulators, large industrial consumers, and Canadian utilities. It's rare that we all agree on public policy issues, but we unanimously support the NERC process and narrow new authority for the federal government in the event of severe imminent cyber threats. Under Section 215 of the Federal Power Act, NERC works closely with electric power industry experts and others to draft mandatory and enforceable reliability and cybersecurity standards that apply across the North American grid. The standards process can be lengthy when addressing highly technical issues, but it can also be shortened when needed using NERC's expedited standards procedures as approved by FERC. NERC also has a FERC-approved process for developing standards in a confidential manner when national security requires it. NERC rules of procedure also give NERC authority to distribute alerts on topics that are important for industry to address. FERC reviews these alerts before their release. There are three levels of alerts, and the top two levels have mandatory reporting requirements that typically require recipients to inform NERC what they did in response to the alert. The alert process has quickly and effectively provided industry critical information on many issues, including Stuxnet, Night Dragon, and geomagnetic disturbances. NERC is required to provide reports to FERC on the top two levels of alerts explaining the level of action industry has taken. To date, these reports have shown that industry takes these alerts very seriously. The industry recognizes the threat environment is complicated and that imminent severe threats are possible. In some cases, even NERC procedures and standards cannot assure that industry gets timely, actionable information to mitigate a threat against the bulk power system. When a federal government at the highest levels determines that emergency action is necessary, it should be able to issue orders to our industry that directly address the severe and imminent cyber threat and set out the mitigation actions needed to protect the bulk power system. Those orders should sunset when the threat has subsided or is mitigated, for example, by development of a related NERC standard. Our primary concern is that the Draft Grid Act creates new authority for FERC concerning vulnerabilities that largely duplicates existing FERC authority and ongoing NERC activities under Section 215 and could substantially undermine the existing reliability standards regime. It should be understood that vulnerabilities alone do not adversely impact the reliability of the grid. That being said, our industry has every incentive ranging from financial considerations to the fundamental obligation to serve our customers with reliable and affordable power to protect the grid when vulnerabilities emerge. 
The Draft Grid Act authorizes FERC if it determines there is a grid, a grid security vulnerability that existing NERC standards do not address to issue a rule or order requiring industry to implement measures to protect against the vulnerability. The new, the new authority the draft seeks to give FERC is very concerning to our industry. First, we question whether FERC has the intelligence handling expertise to exercise such broad new authority. Second, this new authority regarding vulnerabilities would fundamentally alter Section 215 by providing FERC an unnecessary role in addressing vulnerabilities that NERC and industry are managing very well through standards and alerts. To help industry to protect the grid from vulnerabilities and threats, we need timely, actionable intelligence from government. More industry-trusted experts need higher levels of security clearances so we can plan effective responses to threats and vulnerabilities. The draft seeks to make improvements in these areas, and we appreciate the subcommittee's support. In conclusion, we urge the subcommittee to focus on the immediate narrow issues at hand, the need for very quick emergency orders if the bulk power system faces an imminent cyber attack, and the need for electric power industry to receive timely, actionable information. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thanks, Mr. Lawson. Uh, Mr. Kramer, you would agree, then, that the national defense in the interest of national defense, that additional federal authority is necessary? Yes, sir. I think it's absolutely required. Okay. And, Mr. Colley, uh, you had mentioned in your testimony, I believe, that you didn't think it was necessary for uh, NERC to develop standards to ensure the availability of large transformers. Uh, and I'm certainly not an expert in that area, but it's my understanding that the availability of large transformers is one of the key issues out there, and I was just curious if you would elaborate on your position on that. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I um, do take the issue of spare equipment and transformers very seriously from physical attack, cyber, or GMD, and it is a, it's a major issue. So I think we don't have enough information yet to know what the standard should be in terms of how much equipment and, and where it would be located and how we would transport it. So I, uh, if, if I said something opposing a p future standard and, and on, on spare equipment, I may, may have uh, misspoken. I'll have to go look in my written testimony. Uh, but it is a key issue, and we're, we're dealing with it today with some industry experts on a task force that are looking at likely scenarios, uh, what would the need be, how would we move the equipment. So we're trying to find a, a technical solution to the problem before we tackle the issue of whether there should be a standard or not. So are these transformers manufactured in the U.S. today? Uh, the, the vast majority of them have been manufactured overseas and, and continue to be. There's some um, recent activity to bring some on shore, but the vast majority are, are manufactured overseas. Okay. Now, Mr. Lawson, I'm sure you heard the testimony today that in addition to the bulk electric system that distribution should be included in this and of course the rural electric co-ops are quite involved in distribution so would you disagree with that or what would be your position well we believe that the legislation before should focus on the bulk power system uh, distribution is is handled at the local level whether that be a state or a local municipality level or with the local board of a cooperative and, and we don't uh, think it needs to be uh, extended to the federal mm -hmm. level. But how do we address the potential problem in some of these large metropolitan areas that w was mentioned? With, with regard to uh, the distribution facilities in the large metropolitan yeah. areas? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think there, there is one uh, definition in the uh, NERC glossary that is being worked on today, and that's uh, the definition of bulk electric system. Uh, that definition is, uh, is looking at how, how and what should be included under bulk electric system. And one of the issues that the commission has directed the industry through, through NERC to, uh, to review is how those facilities in large metropolitan areas are, are covered. And, and I think uh, the direction that that drafting team is going in that I'm a member of is uh, covering more more facilities in those metropolitan areas than are currently covered under the 
existing NERC BES bulk electric mm -hmm. system definition. So I think things are changing, or, and, and a draft of that definition was recently out for com public comment, and it's uh, now moving on to the uh, second draft phase. So I think there will be changes in that area. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Colley, do you or Mr. Kramer have any comments on that particular issue? Uh, just a couple, Mr. Chairman. The, uh, the industry has a very long history of the issue of local service and distribution being dealt with uh, with the ratepayers in the local jurisdiction, obviously the states and other local jurisdictions. So I think any effort to uh, encroach on that through uh, federal legislation I think should just be taken carefully with consultation with, with the states. On the issue of the military bases, which, I, uh, which was part of the earlier testimony, I think there is an opportunity to have enhanced discussions between the utility company and the uh, military bases to say, do they have what they need? Do they need more backup generators? Do they need more lines coming into the, to, to, to the uh, uh, base? But, uh, so I think there's an opportunity for those discussions to take place, but uh, mm -hmm. I'll end there. Thanks. Mr. Kramer. I, I, I would disagree with both of these gentlemen. Um, first of all, I think we have the smart grid uh, becoming ever increasingly a greater part of the electric power system. And the smart grid means that from the consumer side, from the distribution side, you're going to have increasing vectors that allows for cybersecurity attacks. So I think, if, and those could be national security attacks. So I think that we need to have an overall federal standard that protects against that. The NIST is working on that. I don't actually think they've done enough, but at least they've done something. But I think we need to put that into play. So I would very strongly encourage the committee to expand its jurisdiction. With respect to the, to the military bases and the like, I think Mr. Stockton was pretty clear. They, they don't have enough, and it's not just the bases themselves. If you think about uh, the military, for example, uh, the entire critical infrastructure, transportation infrastructure, the telecommunications infrastructure, all of these depend upon electricity. Um, so even if the bases themselves had electricity, the DOD simply couldn't operate uh, without transportation, without telecommunications and the like. And I think we really need to have something done about that. Mr. Air Lawson. Just, just to add to that, uh, on the military bases, uh, the best way to affect uh, change and improvements is at the local level between the uh, military installation uh, commander and the uh, leadership of the utility supplying that military installation. Those relationships exist today. They're typically very good relationships. And if there are additional levels of reliability, security that are needed, uh, it's very important for the uh, military installation leadership to let the utility know, and they can work jointly towards providing that. Um, with regard to the smart grid, the, the industry is not implementing smart grid uh, facilities uh, carelessly, doing it carefully and keeping security very much in mind uh, in many different ways. We're also working very closely and as much as we can with the vendor community to try to uh, uh, explain to them what levels of security we need and what levels of security already exist in their, in their equipment today. So it's something that we're very uh, focused on and not doing carelessly. Thank you all. My time has expired. And Mr. Rush, you'll recognize five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This has been uh, quite interesting. And uh, uh, Mr. Colley, I'd like to ask you about imminent threats to the uh, grid and also long-term vulnerabilities as well. In the, let's say our intelligent agencies uh, learn of an imminent uh, threat to the grid from terrorists, uh, what would you, how would you characterize NERC's uh, uh, authority uh, to step in and address that threat on a real time basis? We have um, the ability to uh, acquire that information. Th through working with various intelligence agencies, which we do uh, continuously to, to get the information, digest it into what it means in terms of impact on the industry, and issue various levels of alerts. And we've done that. We, we issued one uh, back just in April, which we turned around within within a day. So in, in 
uh, depending on the urgency, we can turn them out in hours or, or days. I think, uh, as I pointed out in my, my testimony, um, we have different levels. Some are just informational, some are recommendations, and there are essential actions, which we've also been able to put out. The, uh, the essential actions are mandatory under our rules, but they're not enforceable from a legal sense in terms of uh, any sort of penalties and sanctions, and that was why I was uh, suggesting in my testimony that that would be one opportunity to improve the toolkit that we have to get timely, actionable information out to uh, and, industry. And that would this apply if there was a severe, uh, imminent and severe threat also? This would apply really to any known uh, threat or vulnerability where there was a high degree of urgency, like we needed to get information out either within hours or days or, or weeks. And I, I think that's a much preferred approach. Everyone keeps referring to our standards, where our standards were not meant to solve a problem in three days or, or three weeks. They're meant to be long enduring, around for years and years. The alert system is meant to solve these urgent actions that you're, you're describing here. Does FERC have uh, sufficient authority at this point? Does, FERC, FERC? does it have sufficient authority at this I point? I believe in the area of uh, vulnerabilities in terms of uh, uh, for example, whether it's uh, Aurora or spare transformers, I believe under Section 215 that Congress intentionally uh, provided FERC authority to direct the ERO to produce a standard that would solve a problem. So under that, uh, under my reading of the plain language of Section 215, the FERC has the ability to direct us to... to Mr. Quayman, do you uh, we, uh, agree with that? No, I, I, I totally disagree, and I'll give you an example. We, we've all heard, this committee has heard about Stuxnet, uh, obviously, uh, and Stuxnet is not a uh, classified problem. A uh, semantic uh, uh, organization, among many others, has issued a very detailed set of reports on this. Um, it's a threat. It's a very, very, very severe threat uh, that we have to think about, and the vulnerability exists throughout the electric grid system because it's the same kind of control mechanisms that Stuxnet attack that are the type that are uh, involved in the, in the uh, electric grid. And it's sitting, it's sitting out there, so to speak, as a blueprint for anyone to use. Now, I couldn't use it, but any capable uh, cyber adversary. So I think that that would be an example of what I would call a severe threat. It's not imminent, but I think that something needs to be done about that right now. And I think it needs to be done promptly. And from my perspective, and as I said, as we do in other kinds of legislation, I would rather have the opportunity for the industry to comment, but for the federal government, be it the FERC or the DHS, but some federal agency, uh, to determine what standards are necessary, what actions need to be taken promptly, uh, and to cause those to be taken under a mandatory system. Mr. Lawson, would you uh, give us your opinion on this? Well, first of all, as I said in, in my statement, the, the industry strongly supports the alert process. Um, I am not aware of another tool out there today that can get information out to approximately 2,000 utilities um, within, within hours or, or, a, or a day or two uh, with specific information about how an, an, a threat or a vulnerability or, or anything specifically relates to the electric utility industry. So I think the alert process is a very critical one and one that we need to, uh, to keep utilizing. Um, also, under the alert process, there are three levels. Uh, the base level is advisory, the middle level is recommended action, and the most serious level is essential action. And I can tell you that the industry reacts uh, very strongly to these alerts because we know that they are, they are communicating very important information to, to the industry and that under the top two levels of alerts, you, you will be required to provide NERC with an update on what you have done with regard to that alert. And those, those reporting requirements are mandatory, and then they are summarized and provided to FERC. So the industry takes these very seriously, and uh, the top level alert essential action has not yet been uh, utilized. So only the uh, advisory and the recommended action have been utilized, and both of those levels have been taken very seriously by the industry, and I'm sure essential action would be taken uh, exactly the same. Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I just want to ask one other question because it's bothering So uh, let me just ask you this. 
any of you, all three of you can respond or anyone can respond. The, what I'm hearing here is that <clears throat> in the event of an imminent, severe, catastrophic cyber attack on the uh, electrical grid system here in this country, where there can be uh, vast harm done to the American people. Right. Are you saying now, is it, am I correct in understanding this, that you're saying that the federal government, or should, let me just ask it this question this way, who are the American people going to hold responsible for their protection to solve the problem and to protect them? Are they going to hold the federal agencies or the industry responsible, in your opinion? Uh, Congressman Rush, I mean, first of all, to distinguish some, some time horizons, uh, first of all, if there's an imminent emergency like planes flying on 9-11 that are going to cause disaster, uh, NERC and I think the industry supports some uh, government agency having strong immediate authority under those kinds of circumstances. Nation is in, in trouble. Somebody has to be in charge. I think we support that. And I, I think the, the other issues, I think, where we get a little bit of difference of opinion, but it's not as bad as it sounds, actually, is on dealing with the things we have longer time to think about and respond to. And all we're saying is that we think that the FERC has, for, for longer-term issues uh, like spare equipment, we're not going to solve spare transformers tomorrow. It's going to take probably years to, to resolve that, is that we have the authorities we have now. And I think we could strengthen the gap in the middle between dire emergency right now and things that might take uh, months to solve. In the interim, we have our alert system, and all we need is a little bit more authority to make those uh, mandatory in some cases. When I testify here today, I'm not here testifying against authority for FERC. I, we work with a FERC today as a partner in developing our standards. They review them and approve them, and I view going forward that we would continue to work with FERC that any thing that we can do to help the industry know what ha they have to do and whether it's mandatory or not, that we would do that in partnership with FERC. Mr. Terry, you recognize. Thank you. Uh, to follow up on that, just uh, have you, uh, uh, Mr. Colley, read the GRID Act uh, or the proposal, the draft? So as it's written now, my assumption is you don't support it. Is that, a, is, is, would that, is that accurate, you wouldn't support it as written? I, I applaud the committee for taking initiative. Just, I got it a and, short and time. Yes or no? I, I support parts of it, not the entire. The budget. jurisdictional part, you have a problem. It, with the vulnerabilities being unnecessary, that's correct. Mr. Lawson, same question. We support narrow uh, authority for the federal government with regard to imminent cyber threats. Uh, that's where we are. So that's a no. Okay. I appreciate that. Uh, just think we have more work to do than I anticipated before this hearing. Mr. Kramer, I want to spend the rest of the time with you. Uh, do you keep track or is there reporting of uh, hacking attempts to your, uh, to your office or any office that you know of? Just to work. Claire, I, I'm a former assistant secretary, so I'm, and I'm testing. I'm testifying my individual capacity here. All right. So I, I read the. Uh, um, there are plenty of reports on hacking that are in the open press, uh, and there are plenty of reports on hacking that are maintained by a, a lot of uh, entities, uh, and I think electrical generation, including electrical, and, and the Night Dragon point was made uh, at this committee as, as an example. Yep, and. I uh, participated in a demonstration at our local generator that showed, uh, was able to track hacking attempts within the last 24 hours, and I think there was six or seven. Mostly uh, been able to track back to a certain university in China, but we won't go into that for this hearing. Uh, now, none of them they were mostly, um, how do I say this, but for fun. It was their 
practice of seeing how they can enter into the system and not for nefarious purpose, although we don't know that when they're trying to do it, when they're trying to hack the system. And that's what concerns me and this committee, is what we can do um, to strengthen our system against those hacks. And by the way, uh, just two questions to you, Mr. Kramer, in my two minutes left. Uh, generally, what should electrical generation companies be doing to, to best ensure that their systems can't be hacked into. And then on the electrical generation itself, there's been some side discussions on electrical generation, whether there are more critical defense uh, bases or buildings should go off grid, totally reliant, and with the small module nuclear reactors may allow them to do that. You have a minute and a half to comment on both those questions. I'll make three point. I'll make three, three points, uh, sir. First of all, uh, with respect to uh, the issue of a serious attack, one of the things that a serious attack would have to do would be reconnaissance. Uh, you won't just attack without substantial reconnaissance. So the reconnaissance or the activities that you were talking about are quite consequential and would be part of any serious attack. And so dealing with those early on is just as important as dealing with the set of issues, you know, when the, uh, so to speak, when the attack occurs. Uh, secondly, with respect to what the industry ought to do, there are a number of uh, uh, standards set forth, both the NERC itself, uh, FERC, DOE, and others have uh, written out, uh, which might uh, I think one is called 20, well, there's the 20 critical activities that was put out by uh, uh, one of the cybersecurity groups. Uh, those were what you might call very good hygiene. And one of the critical things that I need, think needs to be done is that there has to be a, a greater amount of protection provided to the control system portion of the grid than to, let's call it the corporate portion of the grid. And I also think that there need to be uh, what I would call advanced capabilities developed uh, so that you can isolate the control portion of the grid uh, from the corporate capabilities and from vendors and others who have to set, send things in. Uh, I think that there will need to be, as I mentioned, integrity capabilities that do exist now at the bench level, so to speak, at the demonstration level, but are not out there throughout the grid. And I think that the critical parts of the industry, are, uh, Mr. Mark, you mentioned that only 29, I don't have his exact figures, but roughly 29%, if I remember right, of, of the uh, uh, grid was considered critical by the industry. I think it's a much larger amount than that, so I think you have to have a, a, a more significant. Uh, with respect to the bases, again, I want to make the point that even if the bases themselves have electricity, and there are uh, actions going on, I, I can't tell you what the acronym stands for anymore, but it's called SPIDERS. It's a, it's a demonstration program. Uh, and this is non-classified, you can look it up in the, uh, uh, on Google, uh, to make the bases more self-sufficient. And the DOE has a so-called spiders program at uh, three or four different bases. But even if the bases themselves had electricity, the DOE relies on the telecommunications capabilities of the country, it relies on the transportation capabilities of the country, it relies on water, um, it relies on gas pumps and the like, and all of those rely on electricity. Uh, so there's no possibility whatsoever that you could have an effective defense unless you have electricity available beyond the bases. And in addition, that happens also to be true overseas, which is a different uh, topic that the chairman raised, but uh, goes beyond the question. Um, Mr. Rush, do you have anything else you want to touch on? Well, that concludes uh, today's hearing. Uh, we appreciate your being here, and uh, I'm sure we're going to continue to be in touch with you as we move forward on this legislation. And uh, we'll keep the record open for 10 days for additional materials. And thank you all very much, and that concludes today's hearing.